This is part one of Daniel Rowlands and his ministry by J.C. Ryle. And Rowlands was an extraordinary preacher. Uh, he obviously lived in Wales, and he was mightily used by God during the Great Awakening. He was poorly treated by the Church of England, where he was a curate, and the bad treatment that he received when he was renowned amongst the people was largely responsible, we're told, for the people forsaking the Church of England at that time. He was a man who loved the Lord Jesus Christ and delighted to preach the gospel of Christ and was full of the Holy Spirit when he preached. He was a man much used by God. So Daniel Rowlands, chapter 1 of 2, read by David Mackerath, a new reading. One of the greatest spiritual champions of the last century whom I wish to introduce to my readers in this chapter is one who is very little known. The man I mean is Reverend Daniel Rowlands of Clangaitho in Cardiganshire. Thousands of my countrymen, I suspect, have some little acquaintance with Whitfield, Wesley and Romaine, who never even heard the name of the great apostle of Wales. That such should be the case need not surprise us. Rowlands was a Welsh clergyman and seldom preached in, English, in the English language. He resided in a very remote part of the Principality <clears throat> and hardly ever came to London. His ministry was almost entirely among the middle and lower classes in about five counties in Wales. These circumstances alone are enough to account for the fact that so few people know anything about him. Whatever the causes may be, there are not many Englishmen who understand Welsh or can even pronounce the names of the parishes where Rowlands used to preach. In the face of these circumstances, we have no right to be surprised if his reputation had been confined to the land of his nativity. In addition to all this, we must remember that no biographical account of Rowlands was ever drawn up by his contemporaries. Materials for such an account were, not got, to, were got together by one of his sons and forwarded to Lady Huntingdon. Her death, unfortunately, immediately afterwards prevented these materials being used, and what became of them after her death has never been ascertained. The only memoirs of Rowlands are two lives written by clergymen who are still living. Now, Ryle was writing this in the late 19th century. They are both excellent and useful in their way, but of course they labour under the disadvantage of having been drawn up long after the mightier subject of them had passed away. These two volumes and some very valuable information which I have succeeded in obtaining from a kind correspondent in Wales are the only minds of matter to which I have had access in drawing up this memoir. Enough, however, and more than enough, is extant to prove that Daniel Rowlands, in the highest sense, was one of the spiritual giants of the last century. It is a fact that Lady Huntingdon, no mean judge of clergymen, had the highest opinion of Rowlands. Few people had better opportunities of forming a judgment of preachers than she had, and she thought Rowlands was second only to Whitfield. It is a fact that no British preacher of the last century kept together in one district such enormous congregations of souls for 50 years as Rowlands did. It is a fact, above all, that no man a hundred years ago seems to have preached with such unmistakable power of the Holy Ghost accompanying him as Rowlands. These are great isolated facts that cannot be disputed. Like the few scattered bones of extinct mammoths and mastodons, they speak volumes to all who have an ear to hear. They tell us that, in considering and examining Daniel Rowlands, we are dealing with no common man. Daniel Rowlands was born in the year 1713 at Pant i in the parish of Clancunthe, near Clangaitho, Cardiganshire. He was the second son of the Reverend Daniel Rowlands, rector of Clangaitho, by Janet, his wife. When a child of three years old, he had a narrow escape of death like John Wesley. A large stone fell down the chimney on the very spot where he had been sitting two minutes before, which, had he not providentially moved from his place, must have killed him. Nothing else is known of the first twenty years of his life except the fact that he received his education at Hereford Grammar School and that he lost his father when he was eighteen years old. It appears from a tablet in Clangaitho Church that when Rowlands was born his father was fifty-four and his mother forty-five years old. His father's removal could not therefore have been a premature event as he must have attained the ripe age of seventy-two. For some cause or other of which we can give no account, Rowlands appears to have gone to no university. His father's death may possibly have made a difference in the circumstances of the family. At any rate, the next fact we hear about him after his father's death is his ordination in London at the early age of twenty in the year 1733. 
He was ordained by letters dismissory from the Bishop of St. David's, and it is recorded as a curious proof both of his poverty and his earnestness of character that he went to London on foot. The title on which Rowlands was ordained was that of curate to his eldest brother John. So that's the kind of lowest um, ordination level in the Church of England. Who had succeeded his father and had held, and held three adjacent livings of Clangaitho, Clancunthe and Clanju Ibrefi. He seems to have entered on his ministerial duties like thousands in his day, without the slightest adequate sense of his responsibilities and utterly ignorant of the gospel of Christ. According to Owen, he was a good classical scholar and had made rapid progress at Hereford School in all secular learning. But in the neighbourhood where he was born and began his ministry, he is reported never to have given any proof of fitness to be a minister. He was only known as a man remarkable for natural vivacity, of middle size, of a firm make, of quick and nimble action, very adroit and successful in all games and athletic amusements, and as ready as anyone after doing duty in church on Sunday morning to spend the rest of the day, uh, God's day, in sports and revels, if not in drunkenness. Such was the character of the great Apostle of Wales for some time after his ordination. He was never likely afterwards to forget St. Paul's words to the Corinthians, such were some of you, 1 Corinthians 6 verse 11, or to doubt the possibility of anyone's conversion. The precise time and manner of Roland's conversion are points involved in much obscurity. According to Morgan, the first thing that awakened him out of his spiritual slumber was the discovery that, however well he tried to preach, he could not prevent one of his congregations being completely thinned by a dissenting minister named Pew. It is said that this made him alter his sermons and adopt a more awakening and alarming style of address. According to Owen, he was first brought to himself by hearing a well-known excellent clergyman named Griffith Jones preach at Clan Dewey with Breffy. On this occasion, he, his appearance as he stood in the crowd before the pulpit is said to have been so full of vanity, conceit and levity that Mr Jones stopped in his sermon and offered a special prayer for him that God would touch his heart and make him an instrument for turning souls from darkness to light. This prayer is said to have had an immense effect on Rowlands and he is reported to have been a different man from that day. I do not attempt to reconcile the two accounts. I can quite believe that both are true. When the Holy Ghost takes in hand the conversion of a soul, he often causes a variety of circumstances to concur and cooperate in producing it. This, I am sure, would be, of the testi- be the testimony of all experienced believers. Owen got hold of one set of facts and Morgan of another. Both happened probably about the same time, and both probably are true. One thing, at any rate, is very certain. From about the year 1738, when Rowlands was 25, a complete change came over his life and ministry. He began to preach like a man in earnest, and to speak and act like one who had found out that sin and death and judgment and heaven and hell were great realities. Gifted beyond most men with bodily and mental qualifications for the work of the pulpit, he began to consecrate himself wholly to it and threw himself body and soul and mind into his sermons. The consequence, as might be expected, was an enormous amount of popularity. The churches where he preached were crowded to suffocation. The effect of his ministry in the way of awakening and arousing sinners was something tremendous. The impression, says Morgan, on the hearts of most people was that of awe and distress, and as if they saw the end of the world drawing near and hell ready to swallow them up. His fame soon spread throughout the country, and people came from all parts to hear him. Not only the churches were filled, but also the churchyards. It is said that under deep conviction, numbers of the people lay down on the ground in the churchyard of Clanhulli, and it was not easy for a person to pass by without stumbling against some of them. At this very time, however, curious it may seem, it is clear that Rowlands did not preach the full gospel. His testimony was unmistakably truth, but still it was not the whole truth. He painted the spirituality and condemning power of the law in such vivid colours that his hearers trembled before him and cried out for mercy. But he did not yet lift up Christ crucified in all his fullness as a refuge, a physician, a redeemer and a friend. And hence, though many were wounded, they were not healed. How long he continued preaching in this strain, it is, at this distance of time, extremely difficult to say. 
So far as I can make out by comparing dates, it went on for about four years. The work that he did for God in this period, I have no doubt, was exceedingly useful as a preparation for the message of later days. I, for one, believe that there are places and times and seasons and congregations in which powerful preaching of the law is of the greatest value. I strongly suspect that many evangelical congregations in the present day would be immensely benefited by a broad, powerful exhibition of God's law. But that there was too much in law in Roland's preaching for four years after his conversion, both for his own comfort and the good of his hearers, is very evident from the fragmentary accounts that remain of his ministry. The means by which the mind of Roland's was gradually led into the full light of the gospel have not been fully explained by his biographers. Perhaps the simplest explanation will be found in our Lord Jesus Christ's words. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, John 7:17. 7, Rollins was evidently a man who honestly lived up to his light and followed on to know the Lord. His master took care that he did not long walk in darkness, but showed him the light of life. One principal instrument of guiding him into the whole truth was that same Mr. Pugh who at an earlier period had thinned his congregation. He took great interest in Rollins at this critical era in his spiritual history and gave him much excellent advice. Preach the gospel, dear sir, he would say. Preach the gospel to the people and apply the balm of Gilead, the blood of Christ, to their spiritual wounds and show the necessity of faith in the crucified Saviour. Happy indeed are young ministers who have an Aquila or Priscilla near them and when they get good advice are willing to listen to it. The friendship of the eminent layman Howell Harris, with whom Rowlands became acquainted about this time, was no doubt a great additional help to his soul. In one way or another, Hal Harris was a great man of God. In one way or another, the great apostle of Wales was gradually led into the full noontide light of Christ's truth, and about the year 1742, in the thirtieth year of his age, became established as the preacher of a singularly full, free, clear and well-balanced gospel. The effect of Roland's ministry from this time forward to his life's end was something so vast and prodigious but it almost takes away one's breath to hear of it. We see, unhappily, so very little of spiritual influences in the present day. The operations of the Holy Ghost appear confined within such narrow limits, and to reach so few persons that the harvest reaped at Clangaitho a hundred years ago sound almost incredible. But the evidence of the results of his preaching is so abundant and incontestable that there is no room left for doubt. One universal testimony is borne to the fact that Rollins was made a blessing to hundreds of souls. People used to flock to hear him preach from every part of the principality and to think nothing of travelling 50 or 60 miles for the purpose. That's a very long way in those days through a very mountainous country. On Sacrament Sundays, it was no uncommon thing for him to have 1,500 or 2,000 or even 2,500 communicants people on these occasions would go together in companies like the Jews going up to the temple feast in Jerusalem and would return home afterwards singing hymns and psalms on their journey, caring nothing for fatigue. It is useless to attempt accounting for these effects of the great Welsh preacher's ministry as many do by calling them religious excitement. Such people would do well to remember that the influence which Rowlands had over his hearers was an influence which never waned for at least 48 years. It had its ebbs and flows, no doubt, and rose on several occasions to the spring tide of revivals, but at no time did his ministry appear to be without immense and unparalleled results. According to Charles of Barla and many other unexceptionable witnesses, it seemed just as attractive and effective when he was 70 years old as it was when he was 50. When we recollect, moreover, the singular fact that on Sundays at least Rollins was very seldom absent from Clangaitho, and that for 48 years he was constantly preaching on the same spot and not, like Whitfield and Wesley, incessantly addressing fresh congregations, we must surely allow that few preachers have had such extraordinary spiritual success since the days of the Apostles. Of course, it would be absurd to say that there was no excitement, unsound profession, hypocrisy and false fire among the thousands who crowded to hear Rowlands. There was much, no doubt, as there always will be when large masses of people are gathered together. Nothing perhaps is so infectious as a kind of sham, sensational Christianity, and particularly among unlearned and ignorant men. The Welsh too are notoriously an excitable people. 
No one, however, was more fully alive to these dangers than the great preacher himself. No one could warn his hearers more incessantly than the Christ, that the Christianity, which was not practical, was unprofitable and vain. But after all, the effects of Roland's ministry were too plain and palpable to be mistaken. There is clear and overwhelming evidence that the lives of many of his hearers were vastly improved after hearing him preach, and that sin was checked and distinct knowledge of Christianity increased to an immense extent throughout the principality. It will surprise no Christian to hear that, from an early period, Rowlands found it impossible to confine his labours to his own parish. The state of the country was so deplorable as to religion and morality and the applications he received for help with so many that he felt he had no choice in the matter. The circumstances under which he first began preaching out of his own neighbourhood are so interesting, as described by Owen, that I shall give his words without abbreviation. There was a farmer's wife at Stradfin, in the county of Carmarthen, who had a sister living near Clangaitho. This woman came at times to see her sister, and on one of these occasions she heard some strange things about the clergyman of the parish, that is, Rowlands. The common saying was that he was not in his right mind. However, she went to hear him, and not in vain, but she said nothing then to her sister or to anybody else about the sermon, and she returned home to her family. The following Sunday she came again to her sister's home at Clangaitho. "'What is the matter?' said her sister in great surprise. "'Are your husband and your children well?' She feared from seeing her again so soon and so unexpectedly that something unpleasant had happened. "'Oh, yes,' was the reply. "'Nothing of that kind is amiss.' Again she asked her, "'What then is the matter?' To this she replied, I don't well know what is the matter. Something that your cracked clergyman said last Sunday has brought me here today. It stuck in my mind all the week and never left me night or day. She went again to here and continued to come every Sunday, though her road was rough and mountainous and her home more than twenty miles from Clangaitho. After continuing to hear Rowlands about half a year, she felt a strong desire to ask him to come and preach at his Stradfin. She made up her mind to try, and after service one Sunday, she went to Rowlands and accosted him in the following manner. Sir, if what you say to us is true, there are many in my neighbourhood in a most dangerous condition, going fast to eternal misery. For the sake of their souls, come over, sir, to preach to them. The woman's request took Rowlands by surprise, but without a moment's hesitation, he said in his usual quick way, Yes, I will come if you can get the clergyman's permission. This satisfied the woman, and she returned home as much pleased as if she had found some rich treasure. She took the first opportunity of asking her clergyman's permission, and easily succeeded. Next Sunday she went joyfully to Clangaitho, and informed Rowlands of her success. According to his promise, he went over and preached at Stradvin, and his very first sermon there was wonderfully blessed. Not less than thirty persons, it is said, were converted that day, Many of them afterwards came regularly to hear him at Clangaitho. From this time forth, Rowlands never hesitated to preach outside his own parish wherever a door of usefulness was opened. When he could, he preached in churches. When churches were closed to him, he would preach in a room, a barn or the open air. At no period, however, of his ministerial life does he appear to have been so much of an itinerant as some of his contemporaries. He rightly judged that hearers of the gospel required to be built up as well as awakened, and for this work he was peculiarly well qualified. Whatever, therefore, he did on weekdays, the Sunday generally found him at Clangaitho. The circumstances under which he first began the practice of field preaching were no less remarkable than those under which he was called to preach at Stradvin. It appears that after his own conversion he felt great anxiety about the spiritual condition of his old companions in sin and folly. Most of them were thoughtless, headstrong young men who thoroughly disliked his searching sermons and refused at last to come to church at all. Their custom, says Owen, was to go on Sunday to a suitable place on one of the hills above Clangaitho and there amuse themselves with sports and games. Rowlands tried all means to stop this sinful profanation of the Lord's Day, but for some time utterly failed. At last he determined to go there himself on a Sunday, as these rebels against God would not come to him in church, he resolved to go to them on their own ground. He went, therefore, and suddenly breaking into the ring as a cockfight was going on, addressed them powerfully and boldly about the sinfulness of their conduct. 
The effect was so great that not a tongue was raised to answer or oppose him, and from that day the Sabbath assembly in that place was completely given up. For the rest of his life, Rollins never hesitated when occasion required to preach in the open air. Just comment, you know, here we are, they're, they're, they're diverting themselves with sports on a Sunday, and this is a great sin that's confronted, and that confrontation of sin is effective because God is in it. How much worse are our sins in these days? How much worse? The extra parochial work that Rollins did by his itinerant preaching was carefully followed up and not allowed to fall to the ground. No one understood better than he did that souls require almost as much attention after they are awakened as they do before, and that in spiritual husbandry there is need of watering as well as planting. Aided, therefore, by a few zealous fellow labourers, both lay and clerical, he established a regular system of societies on John Wesley's plan over the greater part of Wales, through which he managed to keep up a constant communication with all who valued the gospel that he preached and to keep them well together. These societies were all connected with one great association which met four times a year and of which he was generally the moderator. The amount of his influence at these association meetings may be measured by the fact that above 100 ministers in the Principality regarded him as their spiritual father. From the very first, this association seems to have been a most wisely organised and useful institution, and to it may be traced the existence of the Calvinistic Methodist body in Wales at this very day. The mighty instrument whom God employed in doing all the good works I have been describing was not permitted to do them without many trials. For wise and good ends, no doubt, to keep him humble in the midst of his immense success and to prevent his being exalted over much, he was called upon to drink many bitter cups. Like his divine master, he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. The greatest of these trials, no doubt, was his ejection from the Church of England in 1763 after serving her faithfully for next to nothing as an ordained clergyman for 30 years. The manner in which this disgraceful transaction was accomplished was so remarkable that it deserves to be fully described. Rowlands, it must be remembered, was never an incumbent, that is, he was never a rector. From the time of his ordination in 1733, he was simply curate of Clangaitho under his elder brother John until the time of his death in 1760. You know, his greatest of preachers was kept in the humblest of positions by, by um, jealous, angry um, religionists of his day. What kind of a clergyman his elder brother was is not very clear. He was drowned at Aberystwyth, and we only know that for 27 years he seems to have left everything at Clangaitho in Daniel's hands and to have let him do just what he liked. Upon the death of John Rowlands, the Bishop of St. David's, who was patron of Clangaitho, was asked to give the living to his brother Daniel upon the very reasonable ground that he had been serving the parish as curate no less than 27 years. The Bishop unhappily refused to comply with this request, alleging that his ex as his excuse that he had received many complaints about his irregularities. In other words, he preaches the gospel and calls us to repentance. He took a very singular step of giving the living to John, the son of Daniel Rowlands, a young man 27 years old. The result of this very odd proceeding was that Daniel Rowlands became curate to his own son, as he had been curate to his own brother, and continued his labours in Clangaitho for three years more uninterruptedly. Uh, footnote. For a clue to all this intricacy, I am entirely indebted to the Reverend W. Rowlands of Fishguard. Unless the facts I have detailed are carefully remembered, it is impossible to understand how Daniel Rowlands was so easily turned out of his position. The truth is that he was only a curate. It's almost as though this mightiest of preachers, used mightily by God in Wales, was treated by the establishment as if he was still on probation and being tried out as a possible preacher. Certainly putting him under the authority of his son was, was really against the scriptures, really against God's um, order of things in the Bible. Uh, and um, it might have worked really well if the son and father had worked together well and um, worked in um, a proper relationship with each other. But uh, at this point, Rollins hasn't given us any insight into that. It was, it was trying to the son and trying to the father in this case, surely. Uh, and it was an example of the cruelty that Rowlands received from the Church of England, and which eventually would drive the people of Wales out of the Church of England. I'll continue. The reasons why the Bishop of St. David's refused to give Rowlands the living of Clangaitho may be easily divined. So long as he was only a curate, he knew he could easily silence him. 
once instituted and inducted as incumbent, he would have occupied a position from which he could not have been removed without much difficulty, influenced probably by some considerations the bishop permitted Rowlands to continue preaching at Clangaitho as curate to his son, warning him at the same time that the Welsh clergy were constantly complaining of his irregularities, he preached the gospel, and that he could not long look over them. These irregularities, be it remembered, were neither drunkenness, breach of the seventh commandment, hunting, shooting, nor gambling. The whole substance of his offence was preaching out of his own parish wherever he could get hearers. To the bishop's threats, Rowlands replied that he had nothing in view but the glory of God in the salvation of sinners, and that as his labours had been so much blessed he could not desist. At length, in the year 1763, the fatal step was taken. The bishop sent Rowlands a mandate revoking his licence and was actually foolish enough to have it served on a Sunday. The niece of an eyewitness describes what happened in the following words. My uncle was at Clangaitho Church that very morning. A stranger came forward and served Mr Rowlands with a notice from the bishop at the very time when he was stepping into the pulpit. Mr Rowlands read it and told the people that the letter which he had just received was from the bishop revoking his licence. Mr. Rowlands then said, We must obey the higher powers. Let me beg you will go out quietly, and then we shall conclude the service of the morning by the church gate. And so they walked out, weeping and crying. My uncle thought there was not a dry eye in the church at that moment. Mr. Rowlands accordingly preached outside the church with extraordinary effect. A more unhappy, ill-timed, blundering exercise of episcopal power than this, it is literally impossible to conceive. He was a man of singular gifts and graces, who had no objection to anything in the articles or prayer book, cast out of the Church of England for no other fault than excess of zeal. And this ejection took place at a time when scores of Welsh clergymen were shamefully neglecting their duties, and too often were drunkards, gamblers and sportsmen, if not worse. That the bishop afterwards bitterly repented of what he did is very poor consolation indeed. It was too late. The deed was done. Rowlands was shut out of the Church of England, and an immense number of his people all over Wales followed him. A breach was made in the walls of the established church, which will probably never be healed, but the Church of England today is destroying herself very rapidly through immorality. As long as the world stands, this is 2024, as long as the world stands, the Church of England in Wales will never get over the injury done to it by the preposterous and stupid revocation of Daniel Rowland's licence. There is every reason to believe that Rowlands felt his expulsion most keenly. However, it made no difference whatever in his line of action. His friends and followers soon built him a large and commodious chapel in the parish of Clangaitho and migrated there in a body. He did not even leave Clangaitho rectory, for his son, being rector, allowed him to reside there as long as he lived. In fact, the Church of England lost everything by ejecting him and gained nothing at all. The great Welsh preacher was never silenced practically for a single day, and the Church of England only reaped a harvest of odium and dislike in Wales, which is bearing fruit to this very hour. From the time of his ejection to his death, the course of Rowland's life seems to have been comparatively undisturbed. No longer persecuted and snubbed by ecclesiastical superiors, he held on his way for 27 years in great quietness, undiminished popularity and immense usefulness, and died at length in Clangaitho Rectory on October the 16th, 1790, 90, at the ripe old age of 77. He was unwell during the last year of his life, says Morgan, but able to go on with his ministry at Clangaitho, though he scarcely went anywhere else. It was his particular wish that he might go direct from his work to his everlasting rest, and not be kept long on a deathbed. His heavenly father was pleased to grant his desire, and when his departure was drawing nigh he had some pleasing idea of his approaching end. One of his children has supplied the following interesting account of his last days. My father made the following observations in his sermons two Sundays before his departure. He said, I am almost leaving and I am on the point of being taken from you. I am not tired of the work but in it. I have some presentiment that my heavenly father will soon release me from my labours and bring me to my everlasting rest, but I hope that he will continue his gracious presence with you after I am gone. He told us conversing on his departure after worship the last Sunday that he should like to die in a quiet, serene manner and hope that he should not be disturbed by our sighs and crying. He added, I have no more to state by way of acceptance with God than I have always stated. I die as a poor sinner, depending fully and entirely on the merits of a crucified Saviour for my acceptance with God. 
In his last hours, he often used the expression in Latin, which Wesley used on his deathbed, God is with us, and finally departed in great peace. Rowlands was buried at Clangaitho, at the east end of the church. His enemies could shut him out of the pulpit, but not out of the churchyard. An old inhabitant of the parish, now 85 years of age, says, I well remember his tomb, and many times have I read the inscription, his name and age with that of his wife's, Eleanor, who died a year and two months after her husband. The stone was laid on a three-feet wall, but it is now worn out by the hand of time. Rowlands was once married. Once married. It is believed that his wife was the daughter of Mr. Davis of Glyncoaf, near Clangaitho. Let me try and read that properly. Glynochchaf. Near Clangaitho. He had seven children who survived him, and two who died in infancy. What became of all his family, and whether there are any lineal descents of his, I have been unable to ascertain with accuracy. The engraving of him, which faces the title page of the lives drawn up by Morgan and Owen, gives one idea of the Rowlands being a grave and solemn-looking man. It is probably taken from the picture of him which Lady Huntingdon sent an artist to take at the very end of his life. The worthy old saint did not at all like having his portrait taken. Why do you object, sir, said the artist at last. Why, replied the old man with great emphasis, I am only a bit of clay like thyself. And then he exclaimed, Alas, 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 taking the picture of a poor old sinner, alas. His countenance, says Morgan, altered and fell at once. And this is the reason why the picture appears so heavy and cast down. I bet he was a man full of joy. I have other things yet to tell Rowlands. His preaching, and on the many characteristic anecdotes about him, deserve special notice, but I must reserve these points for another chapter, so I'll try and record that and put that up as well. Um, may God raise up men like Rowlands today. They will have similar persecution, but God will use them for his glory. But may God also raise up amongst the common people in the land a fear of God, a hunger for salvation, a desire for the truth. And may the Lord Jesus Christ have all the glory.